I want your soul. Cooper's eyes slowly opened, but his surroundings remained blurred as his vision began to focus. The afternoon sunlight was partially blocked by thick canvas curtains, causing a sickly yellow light to fill the room. Almost immediately, a jolt of pain throbbed on the back of his head. After a few minutes of agony, it dulled to a pulsing discomfort. While the shape of a couch and end table began to come into clearer view, he attempted to lift his hands from the armrest of the rocking chair. His movement was restrained as he was met with the jagged edges of cold cable ties cinched tightly around his wrists. Feeling confusion at first, this soon gave way to an overwhelming sense of panic as he fought against the bindings. I would advise against struggling, a voice said. Cooper lifted his head as he heard the voice from another room echoing towards him. To his left, he could see the shadow of a man standing over a table. The black shape lifted a knife and brought it down with one fell swoop. The metal blade made a mighty chop as it contacted the butcher's block. Just give me a few moments to finish up my work. I typically find it rude to keep my guests waiting, but this is a matter that simply cannot wait. I'm sure you understand, the voice said. Without waiting for Cooper to give any sort of rebuttal, the man's shadow went back to chopping meat. Cooper's vision had now returned to its full clarity as he blinked away any remaining fuzziness. A vintage television set sat on a shelf on the opposite wall. To his left, the couch came into full view. While one cushion looked untouched, the other had clearly been slightly worn by years of use. To his right, he could see a hallway leading to a flight of stairs in the front door. All done now, the boy said with calm delight as the door to a refrigerator snapped shut. Cooper sat petrified while the stranger's heavy boots thudded on the hardwood floor. Soon enough, he turned the corner and stood in the doorway. The man stood, to Cooper's best guess, a hair over six feet. A shirt stained with blood at the rolled up cuffs hung loosely over his gaunt frame. The skin of his face was pulled tightly over his jaw and cheekbones. Patchy stubble dappled parts of his face. I apologize for making you wait. That took much longer than expected, he said while motioning towards the kitchen. Although Cooper was unable to see what he was referencing to, he had no interest in finding out what it was either. Dinner's on the stove and it should be ready in a few minutes. I take it you'll be joining me, he said. Cooper looked down at his wrists and then back up at the man. Well, I guess I don't really have much of a choice now, do I? This caused the man to let out a bellowing laugh and slap his knee. While he made a spectacle of himself, Cooper sat in silent observance. Let me tell you something, Cooper. You certainly aren't like any of the others that have been here. You have a sense of humor. You may look boring in your driver's license photo, but you seem to be anything but the man said. Still chuckling, he walked out of the room and returned to the kitchen. Cooper heard him open a cabinet and pull out plates and silverware with a rattle. While he set the table for dinner, Cooper looked around the room and studied his surroundings more. The sun was sinking lower, causing the light being filtered by the curtains to now be slightly tinted orange. Although the house was likely decades old, the stranger obviously took good care of it. Every surface was free of dust, and the floor lacked any imperfections. All right, everything's set, the man said. The man returned from the kitchen with a small paring knife clenched in his slender fingers. A wave of fear swept through Cooper as his imagination raced at the possibilities that lay ahead. His eyes went wide as they locked on the knife. In turn, the stranger lifted his empty hand in a sign of calming. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to use this to hurt you, unless you don't follow my instructions, that is. He then knelt in front of Cooper and slipped the blade between the cable tie and the leg of the chair. Now I'm going to cut you free so you can come sit at the dinner table. You are only to walk from this chair to the place I set for you. Well, I don't want to have any trouble. 
but trust me when I say that things will get real fucking ugly real quick if you cross me. You got it? Cooper nodded and continued to remain motionless. The man slid the blade and cut the tie. He continued to cut the others until Cooper was no longer restrained. Standing up now, the stranger motioned for Cooper to join him in the kitchen. Please walk slowly and remember, or get any ideas. Cooper listened and walked to the kitchen and sat down in his new seat without any problems. As he tucked the chair under the lip of the table, his captor approached the seat on the opposite end. Before sitting down, he withdrew a large pistol from his waistband and placed it next to his silverware. This is the first time I didn't have to use this on one of my guests. They typically make a run for either the door or the back door. If you happen to look at the door in my living room, you should have been able to tell that they never made it that far. The more I get to know you, the more I like you, Coop. Cooper gave a forced grin while his mind raced with images of numerous other victims being gunned down no less than ten feet away from where he sat. At least that explained the stains on the floor. The visions unsettled him, but he made sure to keep his composure. Whatever situation he was in, he needed to remain calm if he had the slightest hope of getting out of this mess intact. Is it all right if I call you Coop? I don't want to seem informal, the man said while scooping mashed potatoes onto both plates. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. What do you want me to call you? Cooper asked while attempting to keep his composure. The task was growing more and more difficult as time went on. Oh, how rude of me. I forgot to introduce myself. You can call me Gunner. Cooper gave him a confused look as Gunner slid a plate loaded with food in front of him. It was my father's idea to name me that, and I never questioned my old man, he said. Gunner slapped a cut of meat on his plate and placed the lid back over the pan. Taking his seat once more, he neatly folded a crease in his napkin before placing it in his lap. Cooper glanced around the kitchen and observed the small room. The dishes Gunner had used to cook dinner were already washed and drying in a rack next to the sink. All dishes and food items were hidden away in cabinets, leaving the kitchen spotless. He had yet to see anything out of place in the house, leaving him to ponder on the obsessive nature of this man. Coop, I'm going to make you a deal. I didn't shackle you to that chair because you didn't attempt to run out from the living room. And if you continue to behave yourself, I'll consider letting you off easier than I intended. Cooper stopped cutting his food and looked up from his plate. Gunner continued to scoop some mashed potatoes onto his fork and into his mouth, acting as if what he had said should not warn any questions. Well, what do you mean, let me off easier than you intended to? Well, that'll come in time. Now let's get to know each other. So tell me, Coop, what's your story? Before Cooper spoke, his mind raced for the possibilities of Gunner's statement, deciding it was best to play along with his twisted game. He knew acting casually was still his best defense. Well, I actually lived one state over in Louisiana. I was in Houston for a business meeting and driving home when... Cooper trailed off as his mind then drew blank. He attempted to remember how he got in this man's house, but every image that came into his mind's eye was fuzzy at best. When I found you, Gunner let out. Cooper's head shot up and his gaze locked with Gunner's. In the orange glow of the Texas sunset, Gunner sat still in his chair. The room was now washed in the light, causing Gunner's shadow to loom over them on the wall behind him. He rested his elbows on the table and drummed his fingers on the edge of his glass. Is it starting to come back to you, Coop? He asked as a small grin pulled at the corners of his mouth. At that moment, everything came back to Cooper in a sudden burst. He remembered standing on the side of the interstate. His car had a flat tire and he flagged down the first car coming in his direction. It had pulled onto the shoulder and Gunner stepped out with a tire iron. Although he had not thought much of it at the time, Cooper knew he should have been more cautious. He remembered showing Gunner the gash in the wall of his tire when the blow hit the back of his head. From there, his vision began to blur before he succumbed to the darkness. I guess you remember now, don't you? Sorry about hitting you a little too hard. You just seem so big that... I didn't want to take any chances of not being able to knock you out on the first try. You know what I mean? Cooper continued to stare down at his plate. The bump on the back of his head throbbed once again and his hands began to tremble. Outside, birds chirped in a tree and a slight breeze made the wind chime on the porch let out a few solemn notes. Gunner swallowed the bite he had taken and gently rested his fork down on the table. 
Did you say something cool? I need you to speak up. Working with power tools all these years has left my hearing a fraction of what it used to be. Why? Why did you do this to me? Gunner took a sip from his glass, making sure to not break eye contact with his guest. And there it is. Every time I have a guest over, the conversation always reaches a point where they question my reasoning. I must say, though, Coop, you're the calmest one I've ever had. May I ask why that is? I mean, certainly this must frighten you to some extent. Cooper decided at that moment to lay out all his cards on the table, and this was make or break time. Yeah, it does, but I feel that remaining cool and collected is my best chance of leaving here. For the first time that night, Gunner frowned. Without saying a word, he gathered his plate and glass and carried them over to the sink. The garbage disposal word to life as leftover food scraps were jettisoned into its metallic jaws. Well, I thought by now you would have understood that I can't let you leave. I'll admit that you were the first person to be calm and respectful about it, but I still can't let you leave. He then flipped a switch and the hum of the disposal slowly died. Gunner then began washing his plate with his eyes staring out at the setting sun. The lower it sank towards the horizon, the more orange the room became. I'm going to give you fair warning that what I say next is typically what drives my guests over the edge if that hadn't been happened already. You're different from the others, so I'm expecting that you'll take this with a slight bit of discomfort, but no extreme over-exaggeration. Gunner slid the plate in a slot on the drying rack and dried off his hands with a crisp white towel. Cooper, I kidnap people with the intent to eat them. Cooper felt his body tense in fear. As his mind attempted to firmly grasp this new information, he felt the tear escape the corner of his eye and roll down his cheek. Now, Cooper, I know that sounds bad, and I must sound borderline psychotic for trying to downplay it, but I've got my reasons, and it's kind of a long story, so bear with me a minute. Gunner sat back down in his seat and made himself comfortable. You see, I dropped out of high school without getting my diploma. This left my career choices to be less than desirable. The only option I had left was working in my father's repair shop. We would take vehicles in with large engines like tractors or oversized trucks to use for hauling. Now, my old man, he forced me to do the menial tasks like scraping rust and cleaning off oil and grease. It was far from the ideal life, but it put food on the table, be it barely. Cooper then continued to stare at the table, but managed to take in every word that left Gunner's mouth. A few more tears escaped from his eyes, leaving lines through the dirt on his face. You see, Coop, this town suffered a major crisis some 15 years ago. We had a huge drought, causing most of the crops to wither away and perish. The little water we did have was spent keeping livestock barely clinging to life. The ones that lived long enough to be taken to slaughter were too malnourished to yield any meat worth eating. After all the meat was deemed uneatable, the town met in the city hall to discuss how we were going to move forward. We argued for hours, but every solution was shot down almost immediately. Just when we thought there was no middle ground in sight, my father came up with an idea. We should eat a few of the residents. Cooper then slowly looked up from the table and locked eyes with his captor. He explained that we should only eat what was necessary for the town's survival. I mean, it wasn't like we were going to go over the top or anything. Just enough. The weakest would sacrifice themselves for the betterment of the townspeople. Uh, at first, nobody said a word. As I looked around the room, a few people stared at my dad with blank expressions. Some glared at him with bewilderment and disgust, while others didn't really know how to react to such a horrid recommendation. I mean, you can imagine, can't you, Coop? And eventually, a few people spoke up in agreement of the idea, causing those opposed to start a shouting match. My old man slammed his fist on the table and received everybody's full, undivided attention. He suggested putting it up to a vote. When he asked for those in support to raise their hands, roughly a quarter of the town did so. When asked for those opposed to vote, another quarter of the town raised their hands too, leaving almost half the town undecided. Suddenly, gunshots rang out through the room. Everybody who had voted in opposition slumped forward in their seats. Some people screamed, some people cried, 
Some people sat in complete calm, much like yourself. My father had arranged the whole ordeal before the meeting. His closest friends had all agreed that cannibalism was the only option that they really had left, and it felt necessary to take out anybody who would try and block the path. As the bodies were pulled from the room, my father informed everyone who had not voted that he was going to be in control of handing out everyone's rations. You know, he was going to be the chef, so to speak. You would either take meat for your family or be gunned down on the spot. Anybody caught trying to contact state authorities or leave would also be met with a grim demise and eventually be dinner. Cooper sat there in silence as he absorbed the information. Wherever this place was, he was now caught up in a big mess of a situation. The bodies of those at the meeting were dried and preserved for future consumption. When that supply finally ran out, my father and a few of his buddies resorted to abducting stranded motorists. He knew better than to pick them all up near the town, so he would drive in his own work truck and pick up fresh meat all over the eastern part of the state. This new practice of picking up innocent victims went on for a couple months, but eventually the drought ended and the town slowly began to mend its wounds. However, some of the residents still had a craving for human flesh. And my dad didn't see the need in continuing this operation if it was no longer necessary for their survival. He then made a deal with those who still wanted the meat that he would supply them with it on special occasions like Christmas, the 4th of July, or someone's birthday. Lifting the pistol from the table and pointing it square in the center of Cooper's chest, Gunner chuckled to himself. If it's any consolation to you, Cooper, you're actually a gift for a girl who's celebrating her 16th birthday tomorrow. She's been looking forward to this for months now, and I'm sure you're not going to disappoint her. Gunner then laid down the pistol and walked over to the refrigerator. Opening the door, he withdrew two beers. He popped the caps off into the trash can and set one down in front of Cooper. I really do like you, Coop. You've been so respectful, so I'll treat you to one last beer before I take you outside and blow your fucking brains out. I know it's not the ideal circumstances to have in a final drink, but I do feel obliged to offer a little bit of that Texas comfort if you know what I'm saying. Cooper sat motionless and stared at the beer. Condensation rolled down the hazy brown bottle before setting on the table in a small pool. Now, I know you probably want to say goodbye to your friends and family, but we both know why I can't let you do that. So go ahead and enjoy your drink here before we get started. Well, I hate my dad, Cooper muttered under his breath. Gunner lowered the neck of the bottle from his lips and gently rested it down on the table with a soft clink. What was that? I said I fucking hate my father, Cooper let out through gritted teeth. Gunner's eyes opened just a hair wider as he was taken slightly aback by this admission. Never before had one of his victims stated resentment for a parent. Usually they were crying or screaming by now. Oh, is that so? And why would that be? Cooper lifted his head up and glared with intense detestation burning in his eyes. Well, he's a bitter and abusive old man who took every chance he got to demean me, whether I actually deserved it or I didn't, Cooper said. Gunner rested his elbows on the table, a look of interest crossing his face. He motioned with his hand for Cooper to go on. Every time something would go wrong at work, he would come home and take it out on me. Because my mother had died giving birth to me, my father and I started out from the very beginning on the wrong foot. If I got below a B on my report card, he would yell at me and make sure I felt guilty for my mom dying. Every little slip-up I made was met with a punishment exponentially worse than the action that brought it. As a matter of fact, his favorite thing to do was tell me how if she had lived through it all, she would be disappointed in what a disgusting disgrace of a son I had become and this continued all the way through high school. When it was time for me to choose the career path I wanted to take, he forced me to study engineering, just like him. I wanted to go into something like medicine or physical therapy. I wanted to feel that I was directly bettering somebody's life, but he didn't want to hear nothing of it. He was paying for my tuition and held that over my head and used it as leverage. He was a fucking asshole. As miserable as it was... I got my degree and found a job. 
We both work at the same firm, but I feel to this day that he wanted me to be an engineer so he could continue to abuse me at work. I make good pay, but I'm not exactly happy. Gunner remained silent, mildly shocked, but attentive. So to answer your question in a lengthy way, no. I don't want to say goodbye to my dad. He's a monster, and I wish him the cruelest fate imaginable. I'm no saint, but compared to him, I'm close enough. I just wish that horrible man gets what he deserves in the end. Gunner sat in silence for a few moments upon hearing this. After letting his mind process its thoughts, he finished off the last of his beer. He walked over to the trash can and discarded it. Staring out the window, he watched as the last orange slivers of the sun vanished over the horizon. Well, what if we make sure that he does, Gunner said. Cooper turned around and gave Gunner a puzzled look. What are you suggesting? I'm thinking about making a deal with you, Coop. I like you, I really do. If you can get your dad to come here, I'll let him take your place. Now, of course, you still can't go home, but you can live here with me. I know it may not be the most ideal situation for you, but hopefully you'll find it better than being served at the party tomorrow. I'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and think it over. I'll do it. Gunner turned around with a slight look of bewilderment at how quickly Cooper had made up his mind. Are you sure about that? Cooper gripped the edge of the table tightly at the thought of his father finally getting the treatment he deserved. After all these years... Vengeance was within his grasp. Without saying another word, he nodded. All right, well then I'll give you the phone. Go ahead and give him a call and ask him to come pick you up. Gunner turned and pulled the phone from the receiver mounted on the wall. Handing it to Cooper, he gave him a final look, asking that he was fully confident in what he was about to initiate. Without hesitation, Cooper took the phone and dialed his father's number into the keypad. I sure hope you're happy with yourself. I had to reschedule my whole day, as well as tomorrow, to come out and get your ass back home. Cooper's father then slammed the door to his car shut and marched towards the front porch. Cooper stood on the steps with his hands in his pockets and his head hanging low. Gunner stood in the doorway watching in quiet observance. And you're going to be reimbursing me for gas I wasted hauling that trailer out here to get you home, goddammit, Cooper's dad said. Cooper nodded his head and didn't say a word. And I expect you to pay this man for towing your fucking car here, feeding you and letting you spend the night. My son's an idiot. And I apologize for all this, Mr. Hansen, Gunner said while extending his hand out. Cooper's father shook it. Pleasure to meet you. My name's Keith. I apologize. It wasn't under better circumstances. No, it really was no trouble. Your son's a fine man, Gunner said. Keith rolled his eyes and muttered something under his breath. Believe me that if you lived with him, you'd think a lot differently. Keith turned and walked down the steps. The humid summer was starting to take its toll, causing him to loosen his tie. All right, Cooper, let's get your car loaded up and get the fuck out of here. I'm already starting to break a sweat, so you'll have to buy me a new shirt after all this, too. Keith then stepped onto the grass and started in the direction of Cooper's car behind the house. He stopped after a few paces to find Cooper still standing on the steps of the house. His gaze was directed out at the setting sun. What are you deaf to? I said get your shit and let's go. Cooper remained motionless and bathed in the orange glow of the Texas sunset. The wind blew, causing small pieces of dead grass to swirl around his feet. Well, I don't have time for this shit, Keith muttered as he trudged back in his son's direction. Grabbing his son's arm, he attempted to pull him off the steps. When Cooper refused to budge, his father grabbed his arm with both hands and pulled harder. Suddenly, Cooper took his free arm and wrapped it around his father's neck. Pulling him close, he removed his other arm from Keith's grasp and retrieved the knife from his pocket. Withdrawing the rusted and stained blade, Cooper gave his father one last look before bringing it in against his neck. With one quick motion, he slit his father's throat. The knife made a sickening, tearing sound as it tore the flesh of Keith's neck open. Cooper dropped the blade and placed his hand over the wound. As the blood seeped between his fingers, he closed his eyes and let out a heavy breath. The warm, crimson fluid flowed down the back of his hand and soon meandered around his arm before seeping into his shirt sleeves. Opening his eyes once more, Cooper watched as the life 
slowly fled his father's eyes. Keith slowly lifted an arm and brought his hand up to his son's face. His fingers lightly caressed his cheek before his body began going limp. Cooper then removed his hand from over his father's throat as his body collapsed and he plummeted to the ground. Nice job, son. Quick but painful, Gunner let out from behind him. Cooper turned, keeping his face expressionless. Let's go ahead and bring him into the barn so he can drain before we serve him up tomorrow. You need any help? Cooper stood over his father's body as blood continued to gush out from the jagged slit in his neck. It pooled under his head, turning the dirt and grass underneath the dark brown. Nah, I'll handle it myself, Gunner said. Without saying another word, Gunner walked ahead to open the barn doors. Cooper grabbed his father's ankles and pulled the body through the grass, leaving a trail of blood in his wake. With each step, the sun sank lower in the sky. The wind blew and the crops swayed in the heat. Nearing the barn, Cooper dropped Keith's ankles, causing the legs to slam onto the ground and kick up a small cloud of dust. He retrieved some chain lying next to the door and brought it over to his father. Wrapping the chain around his ankles, he fastened the loop over the hook at the end and pulled the bundle taut. Behind him, Gunner pulled the doors open as they groaned on their hinges. The smell of oil and old wood flooded out, filling Cooper's nose with something else besides the smell of blood and grass. The light hanging over the entrance to the massive barn flickered to life with a loud crackle. It hummed and began to draw in bugs. Gunner propped the doors open with two chunks of concrete and leaned against the frame. Motioning for Cooper to follow him inside, he vanished into the darkness. Cooper looked out at the horizon as the sun finally vanished, leaving him surrounded by darkness, save for the light of the barn. Cicadas buzzed around him as they welcomed the slightly cooler weather of the night. Lifting his blood-stained hand up to his nose and inhaling deeply, Cooper smiled and pulled his dad into the barn. Cooper jostled slightly in his seat as the pickup truck bounced its way down the countryside road. The asphalt had long since faded, giving way to cracks and bumps that marred its surface. As his vehicle cruised down the road, he looked out his window at the fields that flashed by. Rows of corn passed hypnotically by his gaze as his destination drew nearer. He peered in the rearview mirror to see his stepson, Andrew, staring out the window as well. The teenager's blonde hair danced in the air that was streaming through the crack near the top of the window. Cooper's gaze was suddenly diverted back to the front of the cab as his wife placed her hand over his while he gripped the gear shift. Susan gave him a warm smile and squeezed hard. You know, you really didn't need to take the afternoon off to come out here with us. You could have just come the next time you were free from work, Susan said. Cooper grinned as he continued to stare out the windshield. Well, we both needed a break, and I know all three of us miss spending afternoons out here with Gunner. Susan let out a light chuckle that was nearly lost in the wind through her open window and the static lace song emitting from the radio. Finally, Cooper let out under his breath. The familiar white farmhouse Gunner inhabited came into view over the top of some low-lying bushes. Cooper let off the accelerator, causing the truck to slow before turning it into the gravel driveway. As they drew closer to the familiar home, rocks crunched under the tires and the smell of freshly cut grass entered through the open windows. Andrew perked up in his seat and his eyes went wide. Well, you didn't tell me we were going to visit Uncle Gunner, he exclaimed without any hesitation to keep the excitement from his tone. Cooper chuckled and glanced at him in the rearview mirror. If I'd told you in advance, you would have been bugging me the whole way here on how much longer it was going to be. Andrew had now tuned out his stepfather's voice and had his face pressed against the glass. With one final press of the brakes, Cooper brought the truck to a halt with the passenger side facing the front door. As if on cue, the screen door was flung open and Gunner's tall, slender frame stepped out into the sunlight. He wiped the palms of his hands on the front of his pants before outstretching his arms into a welcoming embrace. Well, I was wondering when y'all were going to get here, Gunner let out as Andrew threw open the door to the truck. He bolted across the narrow span of grass that stood between the front steps of the house and the driveway. Andrew shook Gunner's hand and pulled the man into a hug. I know it's only been a couple of months since you were last here, but I can swear that you've grown at least another inch. 
I figured you would have stopped growing at your age, Gunner said. I'm giving you a run for your money. Maybe I'll make it six foot by the end of summer, Andrew let out as a joke. Gunner rustled his hair and looked up as Cooper stepped out of the truck and walked in their direction. They shook hands, but Cooper quickly found himself being pulled into a bear hug. Ah, uh, you should know better than to greet me with just a basic handshake, Gunner said as his voice trailed off into laughter at the end of the sentence. He let go of Cooper as Susan approached with a large smile across her face. Gunner bent down slightly to reach her height and embraced her as well. Uh, it's been a few good months since I've seen you too. Well, my job keeps me busy most of the time, trust me. There's nothing I'd want more than to just come out here and relax sometimes, she said. Gunner nodded and turned to Andrew, who was now swaying back and forth in the porch swing. You know, Andrew, Gunner called out, a new calf was just born earlier this week. Why don't you and your mama head over to the stables and have a look? It's almost her dinner time anyway. You still remember how to feed the newborns we took care of last summer? Andrew nodded with excitement before bolting down the front steps in long strides and taking off in the direction of the stables on the other side of the property. Susan shook her head with a grin before walking behind him. The boy is 16, but still gets excited like a child when he comes here, Susan said with a laugh as she quickened her pace to catch up with him. Once the two were out of earshot, the smile slowly started to fade from Gunner's face as he turned to look at Cooper. I have a feeling I know what this is about, he said with a concerning neutrality to his tone. Cooper kept his gaze on Andrew and Susan as they continued towards the stables. The day was going to come eventually, Gunner. Cooper took in a deep breath as a cool breeze blew across the property. I just wish I had a little more time to prepare my answer properly, Gunner let out. He walked back up the front steps with a board squeaking under his weight and Cooper following close behind. Go ahead and have a seat and make yourself comfortable. I'll get us both a drink. I have a feeling we're going to need at least one over the course of this conversation. Cooper let his body collapse into the cradle of the rocking chair, kicking his feet up on the railing. He slowly pushed himself back and forth as he listened to Gunner fooling around in the kitchen through the screen door. After a couple of minutes, he stepped back outside with a glass in each hand. White Russians... Cooper asked with an amused hint of surprise in his tone. My God, you really are old-fashioned. Cooper took the glass and stirred the liquors and heavy cream together with a small plastic straw. Gunner took a seat in the chair next to him and stared out over the field adjacent to the property. The air had gradually gotten cooler over the course of the day, evolving from a discomforting heat to an enjoyable coolness. You know, Coop, I've been dreading having this conversation with you ever since you married that girl. Gunner took a sip from his glass while Cooper kept his eyes locked on him in complete silence. I don't mean that in a bad way. Every man in this town needs to have the conversation with their kid at some point. Some people don't mind it because they already know the answer, but others try to put up a fight in fear of the possible disapproval the kid has for our customs here. And they all know what results from their son or daughter disagreeing. So I can hardly blame the parents for fighting all of this. Gunner then let out a heavy sigh before resting his drink on the porch railing. I know that Andrew has no clue what goes on here, but do you have any hunch as to how he'll respond when he finds out, Coop? There was a moment of silence between the two men. Bugs chirped in the grass, and the faint crackle of a radio could be heard from somewhere in the house. Cooper swore he could make out the lyrics to The Man and Me by Bob Dylan through the static. They sat without saying a word together. Gunner had his eyes locked on Cooper while he stared out over the land and thought for a moment. To tell you the truth, Gunner, I really have no idea how he's going to respond to all of this, any of it. I've tried taking him hunting to test the waters. He shot a deer last winter, but he was very hesitant when it came to gutting the thing and harvesting the meat. Cooper then made an aggravated sound before pinching the bridge of his nose. That's the only thing even remotely close to testing his feeling about all this that we've done. I honestly have no idea which way he's going to go with this, and I'm just terrified that, that we'll have to kill him, Gunner let out with no emotion in his tone. Another awkward silence hung in the air as Cooper shuddered at the cold realization he had been so afraid to confront. 
Cooper stretched and reached for his glass resting on the porch railing. In one gulp, he finished off the drink and placed the glass back down on the weathered wood. It ain't never easy, Cooper, Gunner said while continuing to stare out over his property. Some of the strongest men I've come to know in this town cried like a baby when their kid was taken away. It's never easy for me neither. I don't like killing them. And no matter how many times I do it, I don't think I'll ever get over the feeling of knowing that I'm the one responsible for killing somebody's kid. Well, then why do we keep doing it? Gunner turned to look at Cooper. He was now sitting fully upright in his chair and staring at him with the most serious look plastered on his face that Gunner had ever seen. Well, you know the answer to that, Coop. Don't make me explain it. Cooper sat in silence for a few seconds before grabbing his glass and retreating inside. He sloshed more liquor around and heavy cream in the glass, hardly paying attention to the proportions he was throwing together. As Cooper came back through the doorway, he stirred the light and dark liquids together with his finger before wiping it on his shirt. He took a large sip before falling back into the rocking chair. Let me rephrase the question, Gunner. I know your reasoning as to what would happen if we didn't do it, but there must have been some incident that caused you to set this in motion. I find it hard to believe that you're doing this as just a precaution. Something did happen or got really close to happening. That had to be the only way. Gunner smiled and looked over at Cooper. You know, sometimes I just forget how smart you are, Coop. There's a damn fine reason you're the only person I've abducted who has walked out of this house alive, he said with a chuckle. Gunner let out a heavy sigh and propped his feet up on a nearby end table. This was probably about... Ah, uh, 12 years ago or so. There was a boy named Rodney who was just a year or two younger than Andrew. Now, we were able to get away with not sending our kids to school for a little while, but eventually, we knew that they would need the proper education. Much to my father's disliking, we let them go back to school. It took longer than my father had originally expected, but it was still only about five months before the incident occurred. He was in a class with a few other kids from the town. There was this one girl named Lily who sat next to him for the whole day. They had grown up together, so it only made sense that they were really good friends. And it was because of this that they confided in each other. One day, Lily went home and told her dad that Rodney wanted to go to the police and tell them everything that was going on in this little town. That very night, her father came running to the front door and started banging on it. I was already in bed, but could hear him from downstairs in our living room explaining everything to my dad. Immediately after this, my father grabbed the shotgun hanging above the fireplace. I was nestled under the covers of my bed, and I heard him slam the door to his truck and the engine roared to life. As he peeled out of our driveway, my young mind raced trying not to imagine what he was going to do next. The following day, Rodney wasn't in school, and he wasn't there the next day neither, or any day after that. I made the assumption of what had happened, and my old man skirted the question whenever I asked him about it. It was only years later when my old man passed the tradition on to me that he fully explained what had happened that night. He pulled up to Rodney's house with that shotgun slung over his shoulder. It was late at night, so his parents answered the door with a lot of confusion. My father told them to not interfere, and simply pushed past them and walked up the stairs. As Rodney's mother started screaming, she collapsed to the floor and my father dragged that kid down the stairs, screaming and fighting the whole way down. Gunner then paused for a moment. The void of silence was once again filled by the surrounding bugs and soft blowing breeze that passed through the trees. My dad took Rodney outside, led him deep into the property, and blew his fucking head off. Cooper was sitting in his hands clasped together and holding his chin up. His gaze was now focused out over the farmland, and the setting sun that was beginning to disappear below the horizon. So you were correct in your assumption, Coop. We don't just do this as some paranoid precaution. We do this because it almost happened. And I don't want anything like that to ever happen again. Should anybody discover what goes on off that highway and in this town, I don't want to be around to witness the fallout of the members of our society would have with any armed authority. Because it ain't going to be pretty. If you consider just ending this all together and letting the generations that remember and participate in it just fade away with time, I mean, that has to be on your mind, Gunner. Gunner chuckled and finished off his drink. He kicked a leg up on the patio railing and rocked himself in his chair. Trust me, 
I've considered it on more than a few occasions. It'd be a weight off my shoulders, frankly. But I don't trust some of the people in this town. There's a reason I'm the sole person who goes out and gets meat for those who want it. I'm terrified that if I gave up the whole thing, those who crave it bad enough would just defy my authority and try to get it themselves. Now let's face it, not everyone is as smooth, clean, and tedious as I am. I'm a little worried that someone would easily get caught, and then the whole town would be busted. I mean, you're talking about a bunch of fucking cowboys, Cooper, that eat people. Now how do you think that's going to go? Off in the distance, Cooper could see Andrew and his mother returning from the stables. His stepson had found something which he now held in his hand, but Cooper was unable to make out what it was from a distance. I know it's not ideal, Gunner said in a somewhat defeated manner. However, it's still the best I can do with the situation my father put us in all those years ago. I've personally never seen an end to this, so the best thing we can do is just try and control it to the best of our abilities. The two men were silent once again. Cooper ran through the multiple scenarios in his head while Gunner did his best to not let emotion cloud his judgment. Listen, Gunner, if we end up having to go through with it, I want to be the one that does it. Gunner raised an eyebrow and turned to give Cooper a surprised look. You know, I've had parents offer to do the same for their kid in the past, but I never really expected that to come out of you. Are you sure you're going to be up for that, Cooper? Well, I killed my own father, didn't I? Cooper said it with a sense of pride as he recalled that night in vivid detail. Yeah, but your father was someone that you despised with every fiber of your being. That's a lot different than killing someone that you've come to know and love like your own kid. I mean, that's way fucking different. Cooper opened his mouth to respond, but he found he was unable to say anything. Look, Coop, I'll give you until tomorrow afternoon to go through with all this. If I pull Andrew aside tomorrow and find out that you haven't asked him about it, and I'm going to have to do them myself. Now, you and I both know that it would pain me deeply to do that to that poor kid. The last one I did was screaming and crying and everything else. It ain't a pretty sight. So for your sake and my sake, I want you to go through with it. I don't want to have to do it. Cooper nodded and focused his gaze on the two members of his family as they drew closer to the farmhouse. Andrew came bolting across the yard with a large grin plastered on his face. Clutched in his grasp, Cooper could make out that he had the post of a wrought iron fence. A spike adorned the top and rust dabbled numerous spots on his surface. Ah, hey there. Looks like you found part of the fence that used to run around this property. That thing fell into disrepair before I was even born, Gunner said while reaching into his pocket and retracting a pocket knife. With one swift motion, he flipped it open and scraped at some of the rust. An orange powder fell into the air, revealing the dark metal underneath. Ah, it looks like most of the rust is only on the surface. How about after dinner you and I go ahead and clean that thing off and get it treated? Andrew nodded at Cooper with excitement and rested the large length of metal against the doorframe. Susan opened the screen door and turned her head back as she stepped inside. Andrew, how about you come help me fix dinner, she said. Andrew heeded his mother's instructions and followed her inside. As the sound of shuffling pots and pans echoed through the screen door, Gunner turned back to Cooper with a serious look on his face. If I were you, I'd talk to him after dinner. Should worse come to worse and we have to take care of him, I personally think it'd be best if the last memories he had were of a night, like this, surrounded by his family. Gunner stood up from his chair and placed a hand on Cooper's shoulder. I'm putting a lot of faith in you, Coop. Please don't let me down. With a final heavy sigh, Gunner went inside to help prepare dinner. Cooper found himself sitting alone on the front porch. The sounds that were drifting outside from the kitchen were filtered out. All he could hear were the buzzing of cicadas and a slight breeze wafting through the tall grass near the edge of the property. Just like the first time he had ever been in this house, the sunset was casting an eerie orange glow over everything. What had once been a living nightmare when he woke up strapped to a chair in Gunner's living room was now a place he considered to be his true home. He had come to love and accept Gunner as the father figure that he never had. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw a faint movement. The door to the barn had been left open, causing it to rock slightly on its hinges as it got caught in the breeze. A soft groan would escape the hinges, barely audible to Cooper over the distance. As he stared at the building that he had dragged his father into, 
The smell of blood began to fill his nostrils while the memories of that night came flooding back. He shook his head and jolted up from the rocking chair, not wanting to think about it anymore. He walked inside just as dinner was being pulled out from the oven. The four of them ate at the dining room table that had been adorned with the first flowers of the spring. There were plenty of stories told and laughter to be had as night began to fall over the small Texas farmhouse. The entire time, Cooper's mind swarmed with the thoughts of what he was going to have to do later that night. However, he managed to keep his composure and put on a pleasant demeanor during all of it. After Susan served dessert, Andrew helped clear the table and put all the dishes in the sink. After they had all been scrubbed and placed on the drying rack, the four of them sat in the living room watching a movie on the television. The clock above the mantel was just about to strike ten when Cooper leaned over and whispered something in Andrew's ear. Andrew, would you mind coming outside and helping me with something? Andrew did not ask any questions and simply followed Cooper outside. As he opened the door, a symphony of the night filled the rears. The entire landscape had come to life with the sound of birds, insects, and other nightlife that inhabited the surrounding land. Cooper stepped off the gravel driveway onto the freshly cut grass, his boots leaving prints in his wake. The two men walked in the direction of the stables, guided by the faint shadows of vegetation in the moonlight. What do you think of living in this town? Cooper asked bluntly, not knowing how else to start the conversation. I, I mean, it's not bad or anything. I'm just not a big fan of the isolation, Andrew said. Cooper continued to walk as he pondered how to continue the conversation. Well, there's a reason this town has remained isolated when many others have evolved and expanded over the years. No, I, I, I know. Cooper felt his heart skip a beat. He almost tripped in a shallow hole, causing him to stumble slightly before regaining his balance. Andrew, whatever you think the reason is, I can guarantee you that it's not. Well, you mean it's, it's not because of the people in this town practicing cannibalism? Cooper was now at a complete loss for words. He had ceased his walking, causing him to stand and simply stare at his stepson. Silence hung in the air around them, save for the sounds of the surrounding wildlife. Although Cooper was tempted to say something immediately, his loss for words caused him to think over his next words carefully. Well, you're even smarter than I originally anticipated, he said. Andrew did not respond to this. He stood motionless and stared at Cooper with unblinking eyes. Uh, I guess before we get too deep into this conversation, I have to know. How did you find out about that, Andrew? Uncle Gunner and I do our best to keep all this a secret from the kids. Andrew then motioned his head to the side, signaling for Cooper to follow him as he began walking again. Deciding it was best not to question the sudden leadership role that his stepson had taken, Cooper followed. Well, not every kid knows. Well, let me rephrase that. Some kids know, but not all of them believe it. The first time I heard these stories was in middle school. I was with a group of friends when some of the older kids started to try to spook us with tales about how some members of the town would go abduct people across the state and on the highway and butcher them. As they continued to walk through the field, Cooper kept his gaze straight ahead. He did not speak a word and simply listened to Andrew's explanation. At the time, we didn't really think of it as anything more than some sick and twisted joke. I mean, who could have thought? It might have just been a scary story from Mr. Grimless, like a creepy pasta. All right, when did you find out that it actually was all real? Cooper asked. Andrew paused for a moment as he gathered his thoughts. It was the day I spent the night at this kid's house for his birthday. We had been good friends for years, so his parents let me stay for dinner and spend the night after all the other kids had gone home. His mom had just made a roast that filled the entire house with an intoxicating aroma. At the time, I just thought she had splurged and spent a little extra cash on the good pork roast from the butcher. Andrew sighed and stared up at the stars in the sky. It wasn't until we were all seated around the dining room table and his mother placed a still steaming pan down in the middle that something struck me as weird. Whatever meat this was, it certainly didn't look like any kind of roast I had ever had before. And when I asked what it was, his parents just stared at me for a minute. The mom didn't know what to say, so the dad just asked me if I wanted to try a little piece. Andrew quit speaking, causing a silence to fill the space between them. Okay, so what did you do? Cooper asked in a dry tone. 
Well, that's when I thought about all the rumors of people being abducted and butchered. I also thought about all the instances where some kids would stop coming to school. It suddenly occurred to me in that moment that perhaps there was some truth to those stories. My mind suddenly began to fear what would happen if I acted out at the dinner table. So I did the only thing that was guaranteed to keep me safe. I took a big slab of it on my own plate and I ate every last bit of it. Cooper could hear Andrew swallow loudly. He assumed his stepson was having to swallow down vomit after reliving that memory. I don't really disagree with it, Andrew said. I guess the only thing I don't like is that innocent people are usually the ones abducted for all this. I guess it'd be different if this was done with criminals or other degenerates of society. Cooper tuned out Andrew's voice immediately after the sentence ended. From deep within his mind, a consideration came back that he tried to keep tucked away. Deciding this was as good of a time to say as any, he stopped in his tracks. Andrew did the same when the familiar crunch of vegetation under his stepfather's boots ceased. Come follow me, Andrew. There's something I want you to see. Cooper turned on his heels and started back in the direction of the barn. Andrew followed close behind. During the walk over there, both remained quiet and to themselves. When they finally reached the tall and looming shadow of the barn structure, Andrew ran back to the house and soon returned with the iron post clenched tightly in his grasp. Trust me, you wouldn't need to defend yourself, Cooper said with a forced chuckle. But I guess if it makes you feel comfortable, go ahead and bring it. Andrew stood in front of the large doors. One of them hung slightly ajar, causing the smell of old wood, motor oil, and decaying plants to come spilling out into the cool night air. It should go without saying, but I want to make sure you understand the severity of what I'm about to show you. If you speak a word to this to anyone, I won't hesitate to put you down. I've come to think of you as my own son, my own flesh and blood. As much as it would pain me, don't think that there would be any resistance of me putting a bullet in your head. Do I make myself clear, son? Andrew swallowed the lump in his throat and nodded his head. Cooper swung the door open fully and motioned for his stepson to fall inside. As Andrew stepped over the threshold, he placed the sleeve of his flannel shirt under his nose to avoid the growing severity of the smells inside. Cooper continued towards the back of the barn where a rickety flight of stairs ascended into a loft. Before going up the first step, he grabbed the shotgun that was hanging from a hook on the wall. As the two men climbed up the stairs, the ancient wood groaned and squeaked under their weight. When they finally reached the top, Cooper reached out and flicked a light switch that was mounted on a structural post with the wires crudely stapled to the framework of the barn. To the right of the opening in the floor where the stairs came up, Andrew could hear a light bulb crackle the light, and a sickly yellow glow filled the area in front of him. Cooper stepped onto the loft and waited for Andrew to reach his side. Andrew could see that the floor was covered by a thick blanket of dust, although it had been disturbed in some places. His eyes then focused on a set of chains that were bolted to a large beam overhead. The links drooped down from the ceiling until about halfway between the beam and the floor before curving out towards the back of the loft and disappearing into the shadows. Before Andrew was able to question what they were for, Cooper lifted his boot and banged it loudly onto the floor. Wake up! He screamed in a deep and booming voice that echoed throughout the building and sent a chill down Andrew's spine. There was a moment of silence before shuffling could be heard from across the space. The chains rattled slightly, causing a metallic clinking to echo in the air. Andrew watched in horror as one hand with the chain shackled around the wrist stretched out from the shadows and clawed at the floorboards before it. Soon afterward... Another one came forward with a matching chain shackle and caused the cracking of its joints to fill the air. Andrew found himself unable to move as the two arms extended into the light and heaved a body from the shadows. A head that was covered by greasy, disheveled hair emerged from the darkness. A mouth appeared from behind matted locks of hair and opened as if it was to scream, but only a painful squeak escaped. Its head slowly turned from side to side, attempting to locate where the sound of Andrew's heavy breathing was coming from. The thing let out a raspy wheeze as its gaze locked directly on him. Andrew started to step back, but Cooper quickly grabbed his shoulder and halted his movement. I brought someone to see you, he called out. This caused the man to let out another pettiful attempt at speaking. Extending a hand further, it caused the chains above to rattle and echo throughout the building. We're going to step towards you. 
We don't want any trouble like the last time, do we? The man's head started to hang towards the ground. I said, now do we? I want to make sure I'm making myself clear, goddammit. Cooper then slammed the heel of his boot even harder onto the floor this time. The boom caused the man to throw its hands over his head and bend down into a fetal position. Stay close to me and listen to anything I say, Cooper said as he motioned for Andrew to follow him. Together, the two took slow, cautious steps towards the man that was now huddled over in a ball on the floor. With each footstep that connected with the floor, Andrew could see his body tremble with fear. Now within close distance, Andrew could tell that this was not some starved monster. This was a human being. Dad, who is that? Andrew asked as they stopped in front of the man. Without speaking a word, Cooper used the barrel of his shotgun to pull away the greasy strands of clumped hair away from the man's face. In the dim light from overhead, Andrew stared down at the face that he had not seen for years. Although yellowed bandages were wrapped around his eyes, he was still able to recognize some facial features. He then felt his limbs go numb, and the iron post fell from his hand. It came down on the floor with a loud thud, causing the man that lay in front of them to throw up his hands in self-defense. Dad, I thought you... Andrew's voice then trailed off. Your mother had to keep the truth from you for a reason. Andrew turned to Cooper with tears starting to run down his cheeks. Your daddy never died in a car crash like your mother told you. She did that to spare you from the truth until she felt you were ready to hear about it. She personally would have liked you to stay oblivious to all this for more years, but I don't see a better time for you to know that than right now. Andrew continued to stare down at the malnourished and weathered figure of his biological father on the floor. The images in his mind of a once muscular and powerful figure were now replaced with those of the weakened person that lay before him. Why, why did you do this to him? Andrew barely managed to choke out through heavy sobbing. Why would I do that? Andrew, that right there is your dinner. Cooper then took in a deep breath and prepared himself for the conversation he had always dreaded would come. I had only known your mother for just a couple of weeks when I first met your father. At first he was respectful to me, and I grew to respect him. However, things immediately started to reveal themselves one night when your mother pulled me aside. She told me about all the times that he would beat her, and how she thought I was the person that could finally help her escape the living hell that he had turned her life into. Andrew looked up from his father to look up at Cooper. A dead expression was plastered across his face as he glared down at the man before them. And that wasn't even the worst of it, Andrew. She told me that he had just recently started to sexually abuse her. It was small things at first, but they eventually grew to be extremely dark and sinister things. It got to the point where your mother would fake having a late shift at work so that she could sleep in her car in the parking lot instead of going home to him. All that Andrew ever thought of his father over the years suddenly came crashing down around him as he stared down at the monster that lay trembling at his feet. For the first time in his life, Andrew could feel an emotion towards his father that he never thought would come forth. Blistering rage. I told Gunner one night about this in confidence when he was visiting. As badly as I wanted to tell the police about all this, we both knew that that would only lead to the possibility of them finding what goes on in this town. If we turned your father into the police, he could just as easily lead them back to what goes on here. Any sort of law enforcement presence in this town is extremely frowned upon. So we decided that the only sensible thing to do was take the matter into our own hands. Remember, in this town, we are the law here. Cooper paused for a moment and sucked in a deep breath before continuing. Gunner and I hopped into my truck and drove to your house one night when you were at a sleepover. As soon as we opened the doors and walked onto the front lawn, we could hear your mother screaming from the inside. We ran towards the front door and could see your father pinning her onto the floor. Thankfully, he had left the door unlocked, so we burst in and took aim at him with our weapons. He was continually punching her in the stomach, and our sudden presence hardly seemed to slow him down. As badly as I wanted to blow his head off right then and there, your mother was too close for me to guarantee she wouldn't be shot as well. Gunner ran up behind him before he had time to react and smacked him on the back of the head with the butt of his rifle, knocking him out. Cooper crouched down and used the barrel of his shotgun to remove even more hair from around the father's neck area. A grimy bandage similar to the one around his eyes was wrapped around his throat. 
Andrew had no exact estimate as to how long it had been on him, but he guessed it had been a few years. We came to later find out that your mother had been pregnant, and he didn't want another child, decided to kill the baby himself in a drunken stupor. But we didn't reach mom soon enough, and she miscarried a few days later. Your uncle Gunnar and I decided it would be too merciless to kill your father after that night. Instead, we decided to keep him alive so he could spend the remainder of his days tortured by the consequences of his actions and of his murder. He brushed the back of his hand against the man's cheek, causing him to flinch. Ain't that right, Mac? Cooper reached into his back pocket and retrieved a pocket knife. He slid the blade under the bandage, causing Mac to stiffen out of fear. Cooper sliced off the bandage with a sickening tear. As it fell to the ground, Andrew stared at the darkened scar across his father's throat. Instead of gagging him, I came up with the idea of slicing his vocal cords. Now he'll never speak again, but his breathing isn't troubled like it would be with a sock stuffed down his throat either. Should something ever happen where the authorities do find him, he'll never be able to say what occurred here. Cooper then grabbed Mac's hair and lifted his face up towards Andrew. This caused another painful squeak to escape his throat. As Cooper placed the blade under the bandages around his eyes, Andrew already feared that he knew what was going to be underneath. Cooper sliced off the fabric, revealing his father's shut eyelids. Zigzagging stripes of black thread held them all together, and Andrew could feel bile begin to rise in the back of his throat. If he ever found a way to escape, too, we didn't want him to simply tear off a blindfold and find his way to the cops. I also didn't want to completely remove his eyes and run the possibility of him getting an infection and dying prematurely. So, Gunner kept him knocked out and stitched his eyelids closed. Although this was a crude method, it was extremely effective nonetheless, Cooper said. Andrew opened his mouth to speak but found himself unable to utter a single word. The man who he had idolized for years and missed so dearly now sat a broken man in front of him, a pathetic shell of the father he had known and loved for many years. A few more tears fell down his cheeks as he struggled to swallow the lump in his throat. I know this is a lot for you to take in right now, Andrew. No man should ever have to see his own father in such a state like this. But I had to make it clear to you that not every bad action that goes on in this town is given to those who are undeserving. There are a lot of times where your Uncle Gunner and I have disposed of some very horrible people on this earth. I just hope that you understand this, that we're good men, and we're doing the right thing. Now, when we get back to the house, I'm going to sit down with you and Uncle Gunner, and the three of us are going to have a talk. Before Cooper was able to finish his sentence, Andrew picked up the wrought iron from the ground and swung it up high over his head. The length of metal came crashing down on Mac's head with a sickening crunch. Small droplets of blood scattered around the floor, a few of them splattering onto both of their clothes. Another gasp escaped Mac's throat, this one even louder than any previous. A crooked hand slowly lifted up in self-defense, only to be met with Andrew swinging the post again with all of his might. Cooper could hear the bones within his hand crack and protrude through the surface of his skin, and Mac immediately retracted the limb against his body. Before he was able to huddle up any more, Andrew brought the metal down onto his father's back. Cooper stumbled backward and collapsed to the floor. Although no bones could be heard breaking this time, there was a sickening thump when it made contact. Andrew could hear his father sharply take in a breath, proceeding to violently heave and cough as blood dribbled down the corner of his lip. Andrew let out a blood-curdling scream as he continued to bludgeon his father in various spots on his back and head. One blow in particular came down with such immense force to the back of Mac's skull that the stitches over one of his eyes began to tear. An eye partially protruded from between the crusty skin of the eyelids and looked out upon the world. After years of being shielded and hidden away, the last thing that Mac saw was his own son, raising the iron post, to kill him. Andrew gritted his teeth and smashed the iron down on his father's head. All the fractures that had been created along his skull finally connected and caused it to cave in. Andrew could hear a stomach-churning squish as bone fragments were forced into the soft and now exposed tissue of his brain. With one final breath, Mac dropped his head into the puddle of blood that had formed beneath him. The one shaking figure was now motionless, and Andrew could feel his chest heaving as he took in deep breaths. Cooper stared at the body in complete awe from his position on the floor. 
He had expected Andrew to have a few choice words with his father, but never anticipated the situation to escalate to this point. Cooper wiped the blood that had splattered on his face with the back of his sleeve and looked up at Andrew. Although Cooper had been spared from the majority of the bloodshed, Andrew's clothes were heavily doused in the dark crimson fluid. The flannel shirt and jeans would have to be burned later to dispose of any evidence, and possibly the shoes that were now slowly being soaked in the blood puddle that crept towards his feet. Andrew, why did you do that? Cooper's voice trailed off as he was unable to ask anything further. He continued to stumble over his words while glancing at his stepson. The blood on his face reflected in the sickly yellow light overhead. Andrew continued to stare down at his father's lifeless body as his breathing finally returned to normal. With a loud clang that echoed throughout the barn, the wrought iron post fell to the ground. Part of it landed in the blood puddle, causing some droplets to fly onto Cooper's shoes. Well, we'll take care of this later, Andrew said without any sort of remorse or victory in his tone. Andrew bent down and pulled at Mac's hand. There was a sickening crunch as Cooper heard the bones in his fingers crack. Something was now clamped in Andrew's fist, but Cooper was unable to make out what it was. With one final glare at the mangled corpse before them, Andrew slowly turned on his heels and walked towards the stairs. As he passed, Cooper stared into his stepson's eyes. The joy and innocence that once filled them had left, now replaced with a cold emptiness. Cooper stood to his feet and quietly followed Andrew back to the ground floor. As they turned towards the open doors and passed under the loft, Cooper felt blood seep through the floorboards and fall on his hair. The small puddles that were forming on the ground squelched under his boots as the men could once again hear the bugs outside. Stepping out into the coolness of the night, Andrew pointed his head towards the heavens and sucked in a deep breath. His eyelids fluttered shut as he slowly let the air out between his lips. Cooper stepped up next to him. Although hesitant at first, he slowly reached out and placed a hand on Andrew's shoulder. He did not immediately react, but slowly turned to face Cooper. The emptiness still lingered in his eyes, but a glimmer of happiness caused the corners of his lips to slightly pull into a smile. You all right, Andrew? Cooper asked in a soft tone. Andrew let out a light chuckle and stared off at the farmhouse in the distance. Gunner and Susan suddenly stood up from their rocking chairs. She bolted down the front steps and sprinted in their direction with Gunner following behind at a walking pace. I'm fine, Dad. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine. Cooper felt the wind sucked from his lungs at that moment. Andrew had never called him Dad before and expected that that day not to come for a long time. Andrew turned and gave Cooper a warm smile before wrapping his arms around him. Taken by complete surprise, Cooper slowly lifted his arms and returned the embrace. You make me proud to call you my son, Cooper let out through tears. And I'm proud to call you my dad, Andrew said just before Susan reached them. Cooper, I could see the blood all over your shirt from the porch. What the hell happened? She froze in place as Andrew turned and revealed the dark spots scattered all over his clothes as well and Susan clasped a hand over her mouth. Oh my God, Andrew, what the hell did you do? She struggled to hold back tears while her hands began to tremble. Mac is gone now, Mom, Andrew let out under his breath. Susan gave him a confused look before shaking her head from side to side. No, baby, your dad has been gone for a long, long time. Andrew stepped forward and grabbed one of her arms. He placed his hand over hers and gripped it tightly. Blood ran down his wrist and slowly cascaded over Susan's skin. The still warm fluid almost caused her to pull back. I know the truth now, Mom. He's finally gone. Andrew pulled his hand away and Susan looked down at what her son had left in the palm of her hand. Sitting in a small pool of blood was Mac's wedding band. Tears began to stream down Susan's cheeks as she held the tarnished gold ring between two fingers. Unable to speak, she threw her arms around Andrew and held him tightly. The wrought iron slipped from Andrew's fingers once more and fell on the grass to his side. His arms wrapped around his mother as she sobbed heavily onto his shoulder. Cooper watched from the side as Gunner finally reached the group. He walked up to Cooper and examined the blood stains on his shirt. For the first time since his own father had been killed, Cooper saw a look of bewilderment on Gunner's face. The man looked up at the barn and then back down to Cooper. Without even having to ask the question, the men exchanged glances and a smile. Andrew then let go of his mother and slowly turned to Cooper, with blood still speckled on his face, and he smiled too. Come on, Dad, 
The weather's perfect for a bonfire tonight, and I know Uncle Gunner's been meaning to burn off some trash for a while now. With a pat on the back, Cooper wrapped his arm around Andrew's shoulder, and the two men started back towards the farmhouse. The moon now hung in the center of the sky, bathing the land in an eerie blue tint. Gunner retrieved the wrought iron post from the ground, and he and Susan followed them. As they walked, she sniffled, and Gunner placed an arm over her shoulder. Susan smiled and wiped her eyes with the back of her sleeve. As they returned to the farmhouse, the iron post stripped blood the entire way there. Small, dark splotches littered the grass in their wake. The doors to the barn swung lightly in the breeze, causing a haunting groan to echo into the night. Adam kneeled on the ground to inspect his freshly flattened tire. As he drew closer, he could hear the last bit of air hiss out from around the nail. Swearing under his breath, Adam pulled off his baseball cap and used it to fan himself. As beads of sweat already began to form on his forehead, he heard the crunch of gravel from behind. Spinning on his heels, he was met with the sight of a beaten and battered pickup truck coming to a stop behind his own vehicle. The brakes emitted out a loud squeak before the monstrous machine came to a halt. The door opened on rusty hinges and a tall, slender man stepped out from the cab. Gunner asked as he slicked some stray gray hairs back. Adam motioned to the deflated front tire before shrugging. I have AAA, but thanks for the offer. Well, the mechanic in town is a friend of mine. I could get him out here much quicker than AAA. Now, unless you sprung for premium, you're going to rack up quite a charge since the shop is way more than five miles from here. Adam let out a heavy sigh and scratched the back of his head. Glancing down at the tire one more time, he looked back at Gunner and accepted the circumstances. Well, if it's, if it's not too much trouble, I'd really appreciate it. Gunner gave the man a wide smile before returning to the cab of his truck. Well, that's no trouble at all. Just consider yourself lucky that I travel this road as often as I do. I'm here to help you, bub. Adam pulled his phone from his pocket while Gunner sifted it through the items on the floor of his cab. He unlocked the device and opened up the messaging app. A conversation with his wife appeared on the screen and he began to type away. Had a flat tire on the way home, a local stopped to help me out, and I'll be getting a tow truck soon, keep you updated. Adam hit send and slipped the phone back into his pocket. As he turned around to call out for Gunner, he was met with a tire iron to the face. The thick end made contact to the side of his head and Adam's vision suddenly went bright white around the edges. He felt his legs grow weak as his weight seemed to increase tenfold. As he began to see black spots, his body collapsed to the ground. His head pivoted around, causing him to smash his face onto the asphalt of the road's shoulder. A cloud of dust plumed around Adam before settling on his previously spotless white shirt. Gunner quickly pulled the phone out of the man's pocket and brought the tire iron down on the screen. He bashed the device until it was nothing more than a twisted chunk of metal on the asphalt. Well, goddamn, you hit the ground harder than most do, Gunner muttered under his breath as he tossed the tire iron back into his truck. Returning to Adam's fallen body, Gunner grabbed him by the ankles and dragged him towards the truck. The tailgate fell open with a loud clang while he took a moment to catch his breath. After discovering Adam was much heavier than he appeared to be, Gunner wrapped the body with cargo straps and made sure they were fully tightened. Finally, he threw a tarp over his new acquisition and used various tools and boxes to keep it held down securely. Slamming the tailgate shut, Gunner dusted off his hands on his jeans and returned to the cab. The engine roared to life and he wasted no time before peeling out of the gravel that lined the side of the road. As he repeated the process of accelerating and switching gears, light from the setting sun filled the cab. Small dust particles floated in the air as Gunner switched on the AC and turned the radio dial. There were small bursts of static until he finally landed on a clear station. The twang of an acoustic guitar filled his ears as the truck finally reached cruising speed. Gunner tapped one hand on top of the steering wheel and whistled along as his vehicle barreled down the small Texas side road and towards his home. Soon enough, his white farmhouse came into view. Bringing the truck to a slowdown, he turned down his driveway and bumped up and down. With a groan from the brakes, he brought the truck to a stop in front of the main door. He opened the door with a creak and slammed it shut. 
Throwing down the tailgate, he made quick work of removing the tarp and unfastening the cargo straps. Adam's eyes were still closed, causing Gunner to let out a sigh of relief. There had been far too many times where he had removed the tarp to find his victim awake and freaking out. Grabbing hold of Adam from under his arms, he heaved the man up and over the tailgate. Much to his surprise, Gunner felt the body slip from his grasp and plummet to the ground. Adam's face crashed onto the compacted dirt of the driveway and slid forward as the rest of his body slammed down. Son of a bitch, Gunner exclaimed before grabbing the man's ankles and swearing even more under his breath. As he dragged the body across the yard and up the front steps, Gunner took notice of the dark crimson streaks that had followed behind him. Looking down, he was surprised to find Adam's nose bent to the side with blood slowly flowing from his nostrils. With even more aggravation, he rushed inside and grabbed an old towel from the laundry room. He wrapped Adam's face up tightly and finished dragging his body inside. Gunner grabbed him under the arms once more, this time making sure he had a firm grip before heaving his body up onto the kitchen table. The plastic tarp he had placed over it earlier crinkled as the old wood creaked under the force. For an average Bill guy, you sure were a monumental pain in my ass, Gunner hissed at the unconscious body before walking to the sink and washing the blood that he had smeared down one arm. After a considerable amount of scrubbing, he returned to Adam and placed two fingers on the man's neck. After a long pause, he didn't feel a pulse. A smile crept across Gunner's face as he finished drying off his hands. Damn, I could still knock him out in one swing. Tossing the rag over the back of the chair, Gunner slipped on a pair of old gloves. He lifted the towel wrapped around Adam's face to find that the bleeding had mostly stopped. Unwrapping the man's head, he discovered a large dark spot swelling under his skin where the tire iron had made contact. Gunner poked the area with one finger, causing the skin to push in under the pressure. He could feel fragments of skull shifting around underneath the skin from his touch. Yep, I still got it. Gunner began the process by emptying Adam's pockets. As he removed a pack of gum, his wrist brushed against something under the man's shirt. Lifting the fabric up, Gunner was met with the sight of a pistol tucked into the waistband of his jeans. He carefully pulled the weapon out and laid it down on the table. My, oh my, you'd have been pretty dangerous if I wasn't successful with that first blow. After turning the other front pocket inside out, Gunner rolled Adam's body onto one side and reached into the back pocket. The familiar shape of a wallet could be felt on his fingertips. Without hesitation, he pulled it out and examined it in the yellow light of the lamp overhead. It was made of a high-quality leather, leading Gunner to believe that he stood a good chance of finding a decent amount of cash inside. Well, let's just see how much Mr. Fancy Man here carries around. As he flipped open the wallet, one of the items inside caused light to harshly reflect off its surface. Gunner tilted the wallet until he could read the lettering embossed on the item's face. Gunner's blood then ran cold, and he could feel his limbs begin to tremble as he read the wording on the badge. Waco Police Department. The wallet slipped from his grasp and fell to the floor. The badge made contact on the hardwood boards, causing a loud thud to echo throughout the kitchen. Gunner felt his legs begin to weaken, causing him to stumble backwards. He grabbed onto the edge of the sink with a death grip as he attempted to steady his breathing. A ringing began to fill his ears while his vision blurred. He immediately shook away the sensation and bolted for the phone on the opposite wall. Throwing his body against the aged wallpaper, he ripped the handset from its hook. Gunner used a shaking finger to punch in a number, and as the line buzzed with distortion in his ear, he could hear his heartbeat echoing as well. After a few rings, there was a click, and a familiar voice crackled through the ancient speaker. Hey, Gunner. Coop, he spoke with trembling words. I think we have a huge fucking problem. In just under a half an hour, the familiar rumble of Cooper's truck could be heard pulling up Gunner's driveway. A door opened and slammed shut. This was followed by the sound of footsteps approaching the front door. Just stay in the truck, Cooper called Andrew as he bolted across the front lawn. Gunner was standing in the doorway with his gaze pointed down at the ground. Cooper was shocked to find he had adopted the habit of smoking after quitting nearly 20 years ago. As the smoke escaped his lips with an uneven breath, Gunner ran a trembling hand through his hair. Hey, hey, Coop. For the first time since Cooper had woken up strapped to a chair in Gunner's living room nearly two years ago, 
the man had not greeted him with a bear hug. Gunner, what's going on? Without wasting any time, Gunner motioned for Cooper to follow him inside. The two men stepped inside and then shut the door behind him. As they stepped into the kitchen, Cooper took in the faint scent of blood floating in the air. He soon caught sight of the bloody towel still wrapped around the stranger's face. Jesus, man, I thought you always tried to avoid the face. Gunner took in another drag from the cigarette and let the smoke slowly trail away from his lips. The entire time, he kept his eyes pointed directly at the body. I dropped him on the ground while pulling him out of the truck. That fucker may have been dead, but that surely didn't stop his nose from bleeding. Cooper walked closer to the table and examined the corpse. As his gaze traveled up the lifeless figure, Gunner tapped the cigarette. Small bits of glowing ash fell to the floor without any concern as to the cleanliness of his home at that moment. Cooper shrugged and scratched the back of his head. Well, I don't get it. Is there something I'm missing here? This ain't that big of a fucking deal, Gunner. We do this all the time. Gunner's cold gray eyes darted to the wallet that was lying closed on the table. He motioned with the end of his cigarette towards it and did not speak a single word. Cooper looked over at it and slowly extended a hand to pick it up. As he inspected the leather, Gunner stared at him with a completely blank expression. Well, goddamn, this guy must have been carrying around a good amount of cash and something this nice. This is a really nice wallet. Opening it up, Cooper's attention was immediately captured by the golden badge reflecting the sickly yellow light from overhead. A lump formed in his throat as Cooper found himself choking on his own words and after a few mumbles, he managed to let the words escape through his lips. Oh, fuck. Gunner sighed and inhaled deeply, causing the last of the cigarette to burn down to the filter. He flicked the butt towards the corpse, causing it to strike and leave a small black spot on Adam's neck. It's real, isn't it, Cooper? Gunner asked with a shaking voice. Cooper tilted it in the light and read over the lettering multiple times. Ah, uh, yeah, Gunner, it appears to be. Out of nowhere, Gunner turned around and kicked his boot into one of the cabinets. The impact caused a loud bang to echo throughout the room and made Cooper drop the wallet on the table. He stared at the black smudge that was left in the wake of this man's rage. God damn it, Gunner yelled. Cooper had never heard Gunner shout before. For a man that he had come to know as being kind and gentle, the sudden outburst almost scared him. Gunner, you need to get a grip on it, man. Obviously didn't know he was a fucking cop. He turned to face Cooper with a mixture of anger and fear plastered on his face. Do you not understand that this is the end, Cooper? I killed a cop for fuck's sake. It's not going to be long until I have every officer in the eastern part of Texas breaking down my goddamn door to put a bullet in my head. You understand how we do things in Texas? This ain't Louisiana, Cooper. And people don't fuck around over here. Without warning, Cooper stomped over to Gunner and grabbed him by the collar. He clenched his fists and gave the older man a good punch to the face. Gunner's head quickly pivoted to the side, his lip now split open, causing a light trickle of blood to begin oozing from the small laceration. Cooper pulled his gaze back at him and shook him by the shoulders. I'll be goddamned if you start freaking out on me. You're the one that always taught me to keep a level head when bad situations arise, and now this is hardly the time to show me otherwise. You need to get a grip, Gunner. Gunner then rubbed his jaw and leaned back against the sink. Ah, uh, thank you, Coop. I'm sorry to lose my better judgment like that. Cooper sat on the edge of the table and let out a breath of frustration, pinching the bridge of his nose. He inhaled and kept his gaze pointed down at the floor. Where's his phone at? I crushed it into pieces on the side of the road. All right, what about his car? Well... It should still be sitting on the side of the road, abandoned, with a flat tire. Cooper then looked Gunner dead in the eyes. There was a moment of silence between the two of them before Cooper spoke once more. Were there any cameras? Cameras? Gunner asked with confusion. Yeah, I'm assuming you only targeted him because you had no idea he was in an unmarked patrol car. Almost all of them have hidden cameras, but some are more noticeable than others. Did you see any cameras, Gunner? Cooper? If I saw a fucking camera, do you think I would have crushed his skull in? Gunner asked sarcastically while motioning a bloodied hand towards the corpse. 
Cooper then glanced over at the motionless body and stared at it. The sound of bugs chirping outside drifted in through the mesh front door and into the kitchen. As he gathered his thoughts, Gunner grabbed a small rag hanging from the back of a chair and put it to his lip. We need to go back, Gunner, to the car. Come again, Coop. I said, we need to go back to the fucking car. Cooper repeated it with a newfound tone of authority. If there was a chance you were captured on camera, we need to go pull the SD cards out of it and destroy it. Without another word, Cooper jumped to his feet and walked towards the front door. Gunner did not hesitate to follow closely behind either. As the men stepped over the threshold, they were met with the comforting cool of the night air. That's a beautiful night for a shit show, Gunner muttered under his breath as they hopped into Cooper's truck. As the vehicle made its way down the abandoned back road, Cooper explained the situation to Andrew. The teen sat in silence as the details were explained to him. Gunner would occasionally catch his gaze in the rearview mirror, causing him to feel a small amount of embarrassment for the situation he had created. Turn right there, Gunner said over the road noise. Cooper cut the wheel and brought the truck onto another seemingly abandoned side road. It's going to be up about a mile or two ahead. As the vehicle climbed a small hill, Gunner felt his stomach drop as the blue and white glow of flashing lights could be seen just over the top. Before he had a chance to say anything, Cooper quickly turned around. Undo your seatbelt and get down as low on the floor as you can, he said. Without any hesitation, Gunner did as he was told. The man fumbled with the restraint before quickly dropping to the floor below the back seat. Just before they climbed over the hill, Andrew took the jacket by his feet and threw it over the man's form. As the truck crested over the hilltop, a short line of police cars could be seen both in front of and behind the unmarked car. Don't stare, Cooper said coldly. Andrew directed his attention back to the road in front of them. As they approached the small gathering, Cooper signaled and moved into the adjacent lane. He let off the accelerator a little bit to avoid roaring by all the policemen. Passing by, his eyes quickly darted to the side to inspect the car Gunner had approached just a couple hours ago. When the truck had moved past all the stopped vehicles, Cooper signaled once more and brought the truck back into its respective lane. Well, did you see anything? Gunner asked while keeping his head pressed on the floor. No, no, Gunner, I couldn't make anything out, and I didn't want to stop or slow down too much either. From behind him, Cooper could hear Gunner beginning to breathe heavily as the truck continued down the road. The three of them remained silent the rest of the way to Cooper's home. When they finally pulled into the driveway, Susan rushed out of the front door to greet them. Andrew hopped down from the passenger seat and opened the back door. Gunner sat up from his position on the floor and slowly climbed out of the truck. A glazed look covered his eyes as he stumbled forward. Susan quickly ran over and placed one of his arms around her shoulders. Andrew did the same, and the two of them led Gunner inside. Put on the news and see if anything is being reported yet, Cooper called from the kitchen as he grabbed a bottle of water from the refrigerator. As he placed it within Gunner's field of vision, the man instead motioned his head towards the liquor cabinet on the other side of the living room. Cooper nodded and grabbed a bottle of brandy and a glass from the shelves. He handed them to Gunner, who in turn set the glass on an end table. Pulling the cork from the neck with a soft squeak, he continued to take a decent gulp straight from the bottle. Gunner did not so much as flinch as he swallowed the dark amber liquid and stared at the television screen. And it looks like tonight that the Kingsland area is going to be getting nothing but intense sun the next few days, the weather girl said with a chipper tone. Gunner took another sip from the bottle as Cooper sat down on the couch next to him. A cheaply animated cloud floated across the screen before the two anchors seated at their desk came back on. Before we get into tonight's main segment, we have a missing persons report out of Round Rock, the male anchor said with a serious tone. Gunner then slowly lowered the bottle from his lips. Shelly Johnson in our Crime Watch division has more on the story, Shelly. The screen then went through yet another cheap transition before a petite blonde appeared. Thanks, Anderson. Police are asking for the public's help in what they are now considering to be a missing persons case. A video of the undercover cop car and the surrounding police vehicles appeared on the television with the word LIVE spelled with all capitals in the corner. A Round Rock police officer was driving back from a call when he noticed a vehicle on the side of the road. 
As he stopped to offer assistance, he found it to be abandoned. He became even more concerned when the destroyed remains of a cell phone were found on the shoulder. Running the plates, the officer discovered that the vehicle was, in fact, an undercover cop car registered to Waco Chief of Police, Adam Blundell. A picture of Adam standing in front of an American flag with a large smile across his face appeared on the right half of the TV screen. More deputies soon arrived on the scene. Investigators were able to pull some footage from the hidden camera on both to the front and rear of the vehicle. Cooper then heard the bottle of brandy crash to the floor and shatter into small fragments. The liquid pooled on the hardwood floor at Gunner's feet as small bits of glass scattered across the living room floor. Unfortunately, the lens of the rear-facing camera was partially obscured by road grime. However, investigators were able to pull audio in a slightly distorted screenshot from the video. This screenshot contains what they claim is the clearest view of the now-wanted suspect. Adam's portrait was soon replaced by a smudged photo with an audio sound wave below it. As Gunner's voice could be heard through some distortion, Cooper stared at the image on the screen. Part of Gunner's face could be faintly made out through the smudge that took up a considerable portion of the image. Authorities suspect foul play, as part of the audio also appears to contain an assault on Chief Blundell. However, we will not play that on the air. This has led Round Rock Police Department to heavily suspect foul play. A red pickup truck, estimated to be from the early 1980s, was also captured on the front-facing camera. However, the vehicle did not have a license plate on it to identify. The image of the sound wave disappeared and was replaced by a screenshot of Gunner's pickup truck and another photo of Adam posing with a woman. The two of them were holding a baby wrapped in a light blue blanket. Chief Blundell's wife, Judith, is asking for anyone with knowledge on what could have happened to her husband to please come forward. The screen then cut once more and was now fully taken up with the video of the woman from the previous photograph. Her eyes and the skin around them were raw and red. As she spoke, her voice cracked multiple times. Pl please, help my precious Adam come home. She took a pause and sniffled. Quickly composing herself, she let out a heavy sigh and looked back to the reporter off camera. I don't want my baby growing up without his father. As Judith spoke the last few words, the minuscule shred of self-control she had managed to hold on to slipped away. She completely broke down, causing the camera to cut off her heaving sobs. We once again asked for the public to assist in identifying this man. The blurred photo of Gunner came back onto the screen, along with the audio clip of his voice. He is wanted by the police, considered dangerous, and the main suspect in the disappearance of Chief Adam Blundell. Cooper slowly turned to find Gunner's eyes glued to the screen. As the segment cut to the next story, his gaze remained unblinking and focused. Gunner, Cooper asked while placing a hand on his shoulder and slightly shaking the man. I, I don't feel so good, Coop. Before Cooper could ask him to clarify, Gunner leaned forward and vomited. It spewed from his mouth and into the puddle of brandy still at his feet. His body began to pitch forward, causing Andrew to jump from his chair and help Cooper push Gunner's body back. His head tilted back, causing his gaze to point directly up at the ceiling. A mumble escaped his lips, but no one in the room was able to make out what it was. Is he drunk, Dad? Andrew asked. Uh, no. Cooper responded while running into the kitchen and grabbing a bag of frozen peas. As he placed it over Gunner's forehead, he reached down and grabbed hold of the man's trembling hand. He's just scared, Andrew. Well, should we be scared? Andrew's question left Cooper without an answer. He continued to hold onto Gunner's hand while a news story softly played in the background. Gunner's eyelids fluttered before his vision blacked out and he slipped into unconsciousness. In what seemed like no time at all, his eyes opened to the harsh rays of the morning sun streaming in through the living room windows. The smell of fresh coffee filled his senses just before his temples began pulsating. Reaching up and grabbing hold of his head, the man let out a pained groan. You're going to want this, Gunner. Gunner looked up to find Cooper standing beside the couch. A mug of steaming black coffee was held in his outstretched hand. Uh, I appreciate you, Cooper. Thank you. Gunner mumbled while taking the mug. Cooper sat down in a chair across from the couch and let out a heavy sigh. Gunner, this is going to be a hard one to get ourselves out of. 
he mumbled while staring up at the ceiling. Gunner remained quiet for a moment before taking another large gulp from the mug. The throbbing began to subside as his body slowly started to recover from the night before. Well, I'm, I'm honestly not sure if we're going to be able to, Cooper. I mean, this is fucking bad. Gunner then took in a deep breath before finishing off the coffee and resting the mug on the adjacent end table. This town has had a few issues in the past that had me worried, but they never really caused me too much alarm. I'd handle them relatively quickly and life would move on. However, I've never had to deal with no law enforcement before. This town has always been able to keep its secret hidden for decades, but this... This is a fucking problem. Gunner nodded his head towards the muted television. The news cycle was once again playing the clip from the previous night. I mean, this right here has me terrified out of my fucking mind, Gunner said. The blurred image of Gunner's face appeared on the screen once more. As the news anchor's lips moved with silence, Cooper retrieved the pot of coffee from the kitchen and refilled both of their mugs. I didn't get much sleep last night, so I've been up for a good few hours trying to formulate a plan that could hopefully alleviate all this. Gunner raised an eyebrow and sipped from the mug. Well, by all means, let me hear it. The biggest concern I have right now is the body laying on the kitchen table. In hindsight, we shouldn't have left your house without at least putting it in the barn. Gunner scoffed as he watched the image on TV switch to the portrait of Adam. Considering how dazed I was last night, I'm surprised a bigger mistake didn't happen. I gotta thank you for keeping me level-headed, Gunner said. Cooper nodded and continued speaking. Once you feel that you've fully recovered from last night's episode, I'm going to take you back home to dispose of his body. Get a fire going as hot as you can and we're going to burn him up. I also want you to take any meat you've got in the freezer and throw that in as well. All right. I ain't got a problem with that. What should I do with the bones, though? Cooper sighed and swirled the coffee around in the bottom of his mug. This is going to be the tedious part. I know for a fact that there are bones from numerous other victims that have accumulated over the years. I need you to be extremely thorough in making sure that that farmhouse and barn are completely stripped clean. Once you've collected everything, you need to grind them up into fine powder and spread it across the wheat field in the far corner of the property. Gunner nodded as Cooper spoke. The last thing we'll need to do is dispose of your truck. Susan is going to pull everything out of it and then drive that thing into that flooded quarry about 15 miles outside of town. I've already managed for Ronnie to get you a replacement with real license plates and everything. He and his wife will meet Susan, and she'll return to your house with a new truck. While you and Andrew finish disposing of any meat, she'll be scrubbing your house from top to bottom. And what about the townspeople? Gunner asked while catching Cooper by surprise. Cooper, I can tell how much trouble you've gone through to come up with this plan to keep me safe, but... I think we also need to consider the possibility of law enforcement questioning the people of this town. Cooper ran a hand through his hair and took a large sip of coffee from his mug. All right, Gunner, well, that's the last thing I wanted to bring up. I think the greatest threat to keeping all this under wraps could be our own neighbors. No matter how they may react to my strategy, I think it's about time we stop this, once and for all. I'm going to call a meeting at the church and try to put an end to it. Gunner sat in silence as he ran over the plan in his head. Cooper waited for him to respond and was taken aback when the room was filled with a light chuckle. You know how many years, how many painfully long and agonizing years I've waited for all this to end? Gunner said with a laugh as a smile spread over his lips. I've tried on a few occasions to make all this stop, Cooper, but there was always a small handful of people in this town who didn't want to hear any bit of it. They like eating people, Cooper. And your little pep talk ain't gonna put a stop to it. Gunner then paused and slowly turned to look at Cooper. For a while now, I've come to think of you as the one that would take my position in this whole operation once I become unable to do so. But now, you may just be the one who could finally put an end to it. I guess we'll see. Cooper leaned back in his chair and stared outside. The branches of the oak tree on the front lawn trembled lightly in the Texas summer breeze, causing a few leaves to break free and tumble through the air. As much as I would love to see that happen, Gunner, I'm just not sure how well some people are going to take the news. I'm going to do the best I can, and I understand what you're saying, but I'm going to try to lay it out. Well, then do what my father did, 
Gunner said, with his tone now reverting to one of complete seriousness. These people fear you, Coop. From the way I've seen them act around you, it's not just a respect of your power. They may be legitimately terrified of what you can do. If someone opposes your leadership, then you need to fight back. Whether that means verbally or physically fighting back is completely up to your discretion. I have complete faith in you no matter what you do. You'll handle the situation better than I'd ever be able to. Cooper smiled and finished off the coffee in his mouth. You know, Gunner, my life has changed drastically since I've lived here. Not only have I found myself taking on a more firm and authoritative deposition, but I have a family. Hell, I never would have even considered having a wife, let alone a kid, just over a year ago. Now I'd be willing to slaughter anybody to keep them safe. Well, I, I know you would, Coop. That's why I'm sure that no matter what happens, you'll be able to handle it. Before Cooper let the emotions overtake him, he stood up and walked to the door. We need to get to work. Right now is the most precious thing we have, Cooper said while slipping on his boots. Gunner nodded and walked over to meet him. Cooper called for Susan and Andrew and all four piled into his truck. Quickly starting the engine, the vehicle sped down the driveway and onto the main road. During the ride back to Gunner's house, Cooper made sure everyone had the details of their task fully memorized. And soon enough, the white farmhouse came into view and Cooper let off the accelerator. As the truck rolled to a stop in front of the home, Andrew had already flung open his door. He and Gunner rushed out and bolted for the front door. The screen door slammed behind them while Susan climbed down from her seat. Cooper rolled down the passenger side window and called to her. Ronnie said he'll be there in about a half an hour, so you don't have too much time to clean out Gunner's truck and get down there. Are you sure you're comfortable jumping and rolling from a moving car? Don't you worry about me. Just make sure you keep this town from going under, Susan said. Susan then leaned through the window and gave her husband a kiss before passing a hand down his cheek. I know how some of these people can be, so promise me that you'll take care of yourself. Susan, you don't have to worry about that. I'll make sure to stop them before they even have a chance to try anything, Cooper said with confidence as he patted the firearm strapped in the holster on his belt. With one final smile, Susan started towards the barn as Gunner finished backing the truck inside. As Cooper drove off, he watched in the rearview mirror as she shut the barn doors. A small trail of smoke from the fire Andrew had started floated through the air while Gunner ran back to join him. God, I hope this works, Cooper muttered under his breath. He turned up the radio to drown out his thoughts and made his way towards the small church in town. When he finally reached the building, he noticed that almost everyone in town had already arrived. The last few people were walking up the old wooden steps and through the doorway. Cooper brought the truck to a halt and killed the engine. Shoving the keys in his pocket, he quickly ran across the grass and bounded up the steps in a single stride. As he ran through the doorway, the heads of everyone sitting in the pews turned to look at him. All the chatter ceased, and an eerie silence hung in the room. Not knowing what else to do, Cooper folded his sunglasses, slid them on the neck of his shirt, and walked towards the front of the room. Stephen, close the doors and keep a lookout for anybody driving up. Cooper said without any tone of politeness. The man he addressed did what he was told and slammed the oak door shut. Cooper walked up the two steps that led to the altar before turning around to face the crowd. He let out a sigh and sat down on the top step. All right. We ain't got no time for bullshit, so I need to know something. Am I correct in assuming that everybody here knows what happened yesterday? No one in the room spoke. Instead, they all just nodded their heads. Good. Now, to address any concerns you may have, I can assure you that the matter is being taken care of. As we speak, my son is helping Gunner dispose of the chief's body. Susan is driving Gunner's truck outside of town. Thanks to Ronnie and his wife for helping us get a new truck and all the necessary registration. I assume everything went smoothly? Cooper nodded to a couple sitting in the second row. They returned the gesture with small waves. That truck will never see the light of day again. Ronnie called out. Cooper breathed a sigh of relief before continuing. Once again, I can assure you that this matter is being taken care of in the most efficient and thorough way possible. You all know how meticulous Gunner is with his work, so I can assure you that after the night, not a single shred of evidence will be left. If he was so goddamn meticulous, why'd he even mess it up in the first fucking place? A voice muttered from the back of the church. 
Cooper immediately shifted his gaze in the direction of the voice. A few eyes darted to look at a man sitting next to them. He stared at Cooper without any remorse for his statement. What was that? Cooper asked while standing to his feet. Everyone in the church watched with dread while Cooper slowly stepped in the man's direction. Stopping in front of the man at the end of the row, he stared down at him with a blank expression. Do you mind repeating yourself, Jack? Cooper said. Jack looked away from Cooper's gaze before speaking. I said, if he's so fucking careful like you say, then he shouldn't have messed it up in the first place. Cooper scoffed and turned away. He shook his head from side to side before looking back into the pew. You know what, Jack? You've got some real fucking nerve talking about Gunner like that. Jack sat in silence and then broke eye contact with Cooper. The church was dead silent for a long time before Cooper decided to speak again. You know what, if you're going to insult my good friend behind his back, then the least you could do is look me in my fucking eyes, Cooper screamed while bending down to Jack's ear. The man tensed up as Cooper's booming voice left a soft ringing. Cooper turned away and began walking down the center aisle. Sometimes I wonder if you people fully appreciate just how much Gunner has done for this community. As much as he's wanted to stop this, you still persist. You're some hungry motherfuckers, aren't you? If he wanted it to stop, then he should have told us, another voice called out. Cooper turned to face where that comment had come from. A look of bewilderment spread across his face. Don't give me that bullshit now. Almost every time he told one of you no, that you wouldn't get no more meat, he was met with a threat that you would just go kill somebody yourself. Now, some of you respected his demands, and I greatly appreciate that. But others pressured him into doing it. It was never enough. He was terrified that someone in this town would go behind his back and just try to do it themselves. I think it's pretty damn safe to assume that the vast majority of you wouldn't be able to pull off what Gunner does, let alone with the same attention to detail. Clean meat. Clean, even-cut meat. Y'all been enjoying it for years. And now here we are? We got a problem? Cooper then stared down everyone in the room. Not a single person spoke while his eyes passed over all of them. You took advantage of something Gunner did for special occasions. These are special meals. And began asking for it on a regular goddamn basis. You know how many fucking hitchhikers he had to get? He couldn't get them every goddamn day. You guys had an insatiable desire to keep eating. He's exhausted himself to the point where I'm surprised it took him this long to make a mistake. You know how many goddamn hitchhikers this town has gobbled up over the years? Hell, this wasn't even his fault. Gunner had no way of knowing that who he was going to kill yesterday, for y'all, was the chief of police of fucking Waco. This is the first mistake he's ever made during the decades of this whole operation, and some of you are ready to crucify him for it? Cooper then shook his head and rubbed his eyes. Gunner told me not too long ago that he believed I was the perfect person to take over this operation when he felt the time came, and now I don't even want it. It's gotten to the point where the meat is more of an addiction than a delicacy. I think some of y'all have gotten a little too comfortable, getting a little too greedy. And that's why starting today, no one is going to be killed for this town's consumption again. Chatter then erupted throughout the room. Insults were hurled at Cooper as he sat back down on the steps of the altar. As some people bolted upright from their seats to curse and point at him, he sat in silence and looked over the crowd. When the group showed no signs of calming down anytime soon, Cooper sighed and quickly pulled the pistol from his waist. A shot cracked through the air as the bullet tore through the church ceiling. The talking immediately stopped and all eyes darted to stare at Cooper. I swear to God that if one more person interrupts me, I won't hesitate to blow their fucking head off of this, Cooper said while rattling the gun in his hand. Standing up, Cooper began slowly walking down the aisle and looking over all the faces staring at him with fear. Now, as I was saying, it's time we put an end to this. With all the advancements in technology that have been made since Gunner's father started this entire ordeal, it's a goddamn miracle that an incident like this hasn't happened sooner. Cell phones and the internet and all this other bullshit. For the longest time, my biggest fear was that a dash cam or something similar would catch Gunner or me. But now I think the greatest risk comes from the people 
in this goddamn church. Despite the direct insult to the crowd, everybody remained silent. Although some members of the group were staring at Cooper with boiling anger, they managed to keep from speaking. I am shocked it took Gunner killing the chief of the Waco fucking police department for me to realize that it's some of the members of this town that he loves that are his biggest threat. The fact that some of you are so stubborn and oblivious to the risks of this operation makes me fucking terrified. Cooper reached the front of the church once more and turned to face all of them. It's one thing to cover up a mistake Gunner makes, but it's way more difficult for me to keep track of everybody else. I ain't got time for that. I know some of you are overly confident in your ability to kill another human being, but I can assure you that it's not worth doing what Gunner does to test that ability. All it takes is a single mistake to bring all the officers in Texas swarming onto this town, figuring out what y'all been eating for years. As he looked over all the faces locked on him, Cooper remembered the advice Gunner had given him. I'm not asking you. Does everybody in this room understand me? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you that neither Gunner nor I will be slaughtering another motherfucker in this town. This ain't about your personal desires. This ain't about what you want to eat for dinner on your birthday. This is about the safety of everyone. I don't want my son or any of your kids for that matter growing up in an orphanage because their parents are rotting away in some federal prison for the rest of their lives because they couldn't knock it off. Now, if anybody has a problem with that, then speak up now. The room remained silent as Cooper scanned the faces staring at him. Just as he was preparing to get up and leave, someone scoffed from further back in the room. And his eyes darted to find Jack, rolling his eyes and shaking his head. God damn it, Jack. I'm tired of being fucking reasonable. Cooper yelled while jumping to his feet and walking down the aisle with footsteps that thundered and shook the floor. Jack, now frozen in fear, gawked at Cooper as he came in front of him and grabbed the man by his hair. Cooper ripped Jack from his seat and sent him crashing to the floor. The man yelled out as he was dragged towards the front of the church. As he was pulled kicking and screaming to the front steps, everyone else was stunned in silence. Cooper stopped at the first step and brought Jack's face crashing down onto the wood. There was a sickening crunch as the man's nose collapsed and blood began to pour from one of the nostrils. I came here expecting us to have a conversation like mature adults. And this is what I met with? Cooper asked with a booming voice while lifting Jack up and showing his face to the entire assembly. Small drops of blood were thrown through the air as Cooper twirled Jack around to show off to the crowd. The man coughed violently, causing even more blood to begin dribbling from the corner of his mouth. I will not be met with resistance, goddammit. If any of you as much as think about going behind my back, I will not hesitate to murder you like the vermin that you fucking are. Cooper once again pulled the pistol from his waist and jammed the barrel into Jack's mouth. He sobbed and found himself choking on the firearm. Keep your fucking mouth open, goddammit. Cooper hissed before slamming Jack's jaw down onto the bottom step. As his teeth dug into the wood, Jack then began crying. He felt the sole of Cooper's cowboy boot press into the back of his skull, and then he heard a voice whisper in his ear with the most sadistic tone he had ever heard in his life. Somebody needs to be made a fucking example of. Before Jack could even contemplate a response, Cooper lifted his foot and brought it crashing down on the back of his skull. A loud crack echoed throughout the church as Jack's jaw shattered and bent down against his neck. Cooper brought his boot back once more and stomped even harder on the man's skull again. He repeated the process a couple more times until he felt the bone collapse under his foot. The head tilted back to an unnatural angle as Jack's spinal cord snapped and his body went limp. With his chest heaving from deep breaths, Cooper bent down and grabbed hold of the now bloodied clumps of hair. Lifting Jack's body up, he twirled it around to face the crowd. Some looked away while others stared in complete shock at the tongue and jaw hanging down against his neck. One of Jack's eyes lolled down in the socket while the other one bulged out. Let this right here be a lesson to all of you. If I even hear the smallest rumor that someone is about to go behind my back, 
I will make sure that you leave this earth under that hot Texas sun with the most immense pain and suffering that I can fucking do. Cooper threw Jack's body forward, causing it to slide a short distance across the floor and leave a dark crimson smear across it. As blood began to pool around Jack's deformed head, those sitting in the nearest pews scooted away. The liquid reflected the spectrum of colored light pouring into the room through the stained glass windows behind Cooper. This town has once again reached a turning point in its history. One path leads to a bright future where we can all trust each other, and the other one leads to deception, more death, and the possibility of local law enforcement raining down upon your homes like a fucking plague. The latter can be avoided if you simply do as I say and do not deceive me. Do I have any more goddamn oppositions in this church? Cooper glanced over everyone to find them all nodding their heads at him. A smile pulled at the corner of his lips. Good. Now someone fetch me a bottle of hydrogen peroxide rags and a few trash bags. I need some assistance cleaning up this piece of shit. Multiple people bolted from their seats. A few went into the back of the church while the owner of the pharmacy ran to his truck to retrieve the needed chemicals. Cooper sat back down on the top step. Using the back of his hand, he wiped the small drops of blood from his face and stared down at Jack's body. Ronnie soon appeared by his side with his head shaking. It's a real shame that guy had to go, Ronnie said as two women appeared from behind the altar with trash bags. Yeah, well, he was too goddamn arrogant, Cooper let out with a hint of amusement. I never really liked that poor son of a bitch anyways. Cooper spent the next few hours supervising the cleanup and speaking with various members of the town. Some showed their appreciation by explaining how they had also felt uneasy and wanted the practice to end years ago. Others seemed slightly upset about never having human meat again, but were respectful to Cooper and promised that they would assist in keeping the secret buried forever. As the last spot of blood was lifted from the floorboards, Cooper tied up the bag and carried it out to his truck. He slid the cover over the bed and slammed the tailgate closed. The last few cars parked in front of the church pulled away. Cooper climbed into the cab and brought the engine to life. He removed the sunglasses from the neck of his shirt and flipped them open. Placing the lenses over his eyes, he realized there were small flecks of blood on the polarized acrylic. He quickly brushed them on his shirt before pulling his truck out onto the road. Making sure not to speed, Cooper took the familiar route to Gunner's farmhouse. As he pulled down the gravel driveway, he was surprised to find smoke still floating in the air from behind it. He brought the vehicle to a stop and killed the engine. Y'all almost done? Cooper yelled while slamming the door. Yeah, Dad, we're about halfway there. Andrew's voice called from around the corner. As Cooper walked over the tall grass, he caught sight of the smoldering pile sitting in the backyard. Andrew turned to face his father and revealed the large amount of blood splattered across his apron. Glad to see I'm not the only one who had a little mishap, he joked while motioning towards Cooper's shirt. Yeah, well, someone needed to be dealt with before I could leave, Cooper said. The back door creaked open and Gunner came down the steps. He carried a large chunk of flesh in a plastic container. Bringing it to the fire, he dumped the contents into the inferno. Jesus, Coop, I wasn't expecting things to get that heated, Gunner said as the skin on what he had just thrown out began to sizzle and pop. Well, Jack Anderson doubted my authority, so I had to put him in his place. Gunner smiled and wiped the blood from his hands on an old rag. With a chuckle, he tossed the blood-soaked cloth into the fire. Yeah, well, I knew that if someone questioned your authority, Coop, you wouldn't even hesitate to put up a fight. Cooper scratched the back of his neck and looked back at his truck. Yeah, right, about that. I did a little bit more than fight back. I know the two of you have enough work dealing with Adam as it is, but there's a little more we need to take care of. I'd be more than happy to give you a hand with this one as well. Just back your truck up and we'll take care of it, Gunner said while tying the strings of his apron around his back once more. You're lucky that your son has gotten good at this, or else I'd be a little more worried, Gunner said. Cooper looked over at Andrew and smiled. As proud as I am, I hope you don't feel upset about having this newfound skill and never being able to use it after today. Andrew smiled at his father as he let one of the trash bags hit the ground with a thud. Well, like you said earlier, Dad, this is all for the better. Change may not always be pleasant, but it's what lies ahead that makes all the discomfort worth it. 
Cooper's cell phone rang just as Andrew finished speaking. He quickly pulled the device from his pocket and swiped the screen to answer. Hello? Cooper? A voice panted out from the other end. Mike? I thought I recognized that voice. Is everything okay? Cooper, a caravan of Texas State Trooper vehicles is headed your way. Cooper's limbs then went numb as the sentence echoed in his head. His lips moved to speak, but he found himself unable to. Cooper, did you hear me? Cooper shook his head and stumbled over his words. Yeah, yeah, Mike, I heard you. Jesus, how the hell did they find out? Andrew and Gunner both stopped working. They stared at Cooper with bewilderment as the fire continued to pop and snap behind them. Gunner stepped closer with a look of worry slowly growing on his face. A couple of them came to Ronnie's shop to ask if he recognized the photo of Gunner's truck that's been circulating on the news. He keeps a small collection of photos of customers behind the desk, and they noticed the one of Gunner standing in front of his truck. He had no choice but to hand it over when they asked for it. I mean, it was right there in plain sight, Coop. There was nothing he could do about it. Cooper ran a hand through his hair and grabbed the tuft out of frustration. His breathing was continuing to quicken while he struggled to grasp the reality of the situation. Ronnie just called me and wanted me to warn you. You probably got ten minutes before they're there. I'm sorry, Coop. Nah, nah, it's fine, Mike. You don't need to apologize. We tried our best. Without another word, Cooper ended the call and dropped the phone back in his pocket. His eyes stared down at the ground while the world around him seemed to spin. As he slowly lifted his head to look at Gunner, he could already feel tears forming in the corner of his eyes. Without warning, he turned around and slammed his fists against the house's siding. Fuck! He slammed again, causing Susan to run out of the back door and down the steps. She ran over to Cooper and placed her hands on his shoulders. She turned to look at Andrew and Gunner for an explanation, but her son's expression explained the entire situation. So, what ended up giving me away? Gunner asked. The photo of you and that truck hanging behind Ronnie's desk? Cooper let out with a sniffle. Gunner smiled and looked out in the direction of the field. The wind picked up, causing the smoke from the fire to billow behind him. Yeah, I forgot about that damn thing. Old Ronnie took that the day he sold that truck to me. Had I known it had been my undoing, I would have denied him taking it all those years ago. Any idea how much time I got until they're here? Maybe ten minutes at most? Gunner paused and looked down at the trash bags that littered the ground around the fire. After the three men stood in silence, he looked up to the sky. Pink and orange streaks of clouds scattered the dark blue sky as the sun began to sink lower. Another breeze blew across the property and he inhaled deeply. You smell that, Coop? One of my favorite things about living out here is being able to smell the scent of the crops carried on the breeze. It really puts my mind at ease. Cooper found himself awestruck at just how calm Gunner was behaving. What are you talking about, man? Do you not understand that a small army of police are on their way here to arrest you? Nah, Coop, I'm totally aware. I'm just taking a minute to appreciate the last few moments I have on this earth. Cooper looked over to his son. Andrew was staring at Gunner with trembling lips and tears streaming down his cheeks. It really is the damnedest thing, Coop. I was scared out of my mind last night about getting caught. And what upset me most wasn't the thought of going to jail or being executed. I was most worried about how you would be able to handle my absence. Gunner turned to look at Andrew and then Susan. I don't have a single doubt in my mind that you're fully capable to keep this town safe. If you fight for it even half as much as you do for your own family, then I have no worries of its future. Cooper sobbed and quickly wiped the tears from his eyes with the back of his sleeve. Gunner, you, you can't let them get you. We can find somewhere else for you to live. Gunner held up a hand and signaled for Cooper to stop talking. As much as I appreciate you wanting to help me, Coop, I've come to accept that my time on this earth is over. If I leave, then they'll interrogate the town. Eventually somebody will break and our history will be brought into the light for all the world to gawk at. My chances of surviving a shootout are also extremely slim, so I don't see the use at this point. It's time for me to take my secret to the grave. After all, I think you and I can both agree that prison ain't exactly the place for me. 
Gunner then stepped forward and pulled a knife from his back pocket. He pulled Cooper's hand from his side and placed the blade in his palm. I still remember telling you about how I would threaten my victims with this very knife. It was the night that you woke up strapped to that chair in my living room. You remember that? Gunner patted the knife before Cooper wrapped his fingers around it inside heavily. I never would have thought earlier that day just how that evening would have played out. Had I known that you would end up being the person I ended up trusting to run this town in my absence, I would have put your unconscious body in the passenger seat instead of the truck bed. Cooper laughed a little and gave up the fight of holding back tears. They ran down his face and left streaks through the blood spatter that had partially dried on his skin. Without warning, he leaned forward and wrapped his arms around Gunner. As he wailed, Gunner patted Cooper on the back and returned the embrace. I, I know it hurts, Coop, and it's going to hurt for a long time. There's no shortcut around death. There ain't no shortcut around the grieving process. All I can say is, don't let it cloud your judgment. Cooper pulled away and looked Gunner dead in the eyes. He sniffled and found the man smiling at him. Despite the severity of the situation, Cooper smiled back and extended his hand. And Gunner grabbed it and shook. Thank you, Gunner, for everything that you've done. I couldn't imagine a better life than the one you helped me lead. Keep your head high, Coop. Gunner then turned to Andrew and embraced him. Listen to your old man, Andrew. No matter what you may think at times, he always knows what's best. I, I will, Uncle Gunner. Andrew barely managed to choke it out. He then turned to Susan, who ran up and gave the man a kiss on the cheek and a hug. Keep up the good work with this one, Susan. I know you'll continue to keep him in line. She smiled and turned to her husband. Cooper returned the gesture to her before Gunner began walking to the back door. Y'all best be getting a move on. Those officers can't be too far away now. I don't want you seen leaving this property. With a final wave, Gunner vanished into the house. The screen door slammed behind him and footsteps could be heard going to the living room. Cooper, Susan, and Andrew quickly went to the truck. The doors creaked open as everyone hurried to pile inside. Before Cooper started the engine, he heard the familiar crackle of static from Gunner's radio. They sat in the cab and he stared forward over the property. A cool breeze entered through the open windows, bringing with it the smell of crops. Various memories of visiting Gunner filled his mind as Cooper watched tree branches sway in the wind with the orange sun glowing behind them. Wrapping his fingers around the keys to crank the ignition, Cooper paused when a gunshot rang out. He immediately stopped. Slowly looking up into the rearview mirror, Cooper caught a quick glance of a small blood splatter on the old curtains of the living room windows. He shut his eyes and looked back down at the steering wheel. He let out a deep breath before pushing in the clutch and turning the keys. The truck roared to life and Cooper shifted it into gear. He sped down the driveway with everyone in complete silence. Pulling out onto the main road, Cooper slowly looked back into the rearview mirror. He watched with hot tears cascading down his face as the white farmhouse slowly vanished away from view. Looking back to the faded road, Cooper remained silent as the truck sped off into the Texas sunset.